So with us this morning, Dave Ryan, to my right from Wicomico County, moving down the stage, Melanie Purcell, Worcester County, Susan Banks, Dorchester County, Danny Thompson from Somerset County, William Pfaff from Sussex County, Delaware, and not, last but not least, of course, Rich Morrison, Accomack County, Virginia. They're each going to go through some presentations about their jurisdictions. As time allows at the end, there's the microphone. We'll ask for questions if we have time uh, from all of you. So without further ado, we're going to start off to my right with Dave Ryan. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Seriously? Good morning. I, uh, Christine and I, my wife, were in downtown Salisbury for dinner. That's been a month or two ago. I went to a restaurant in downtown and we, we couldn't get in. And so we went to a second restaurant in downtown and we couldn't get in. I went to a third restaurant in downtown Salisbury and once again, we couldn't get in. And I reminded them that Salisbury Wicomico Economic Development just finished handing out $3.3 million in grants to restaurants throughout Wicomico, <laughs> including downtown Salisbury. And we were about to come out with a new program for restaurants in a couple more weeks. We still couldn't get in, so we ended up at Five Guys to celebrate 31 years of marriage. And I highly recommend Five Guys for their... <laughs> Um, what a difference a year makes, really. Um, it was this time last year, and seriously, uh, that 30,000 people in our market area were losing their jobs, at least on a uh, temporary basis. And we now know, in hindsight, the pandemic was discriminatory. I mean, it, it, impact, it did not impact everyone equally. In fact, it probably hit hardest those that could least afford a major disruption in their livelihood or a major disruption in their business operation. So we were asked to deploy capital to our small businesses. We did so through the CARES Act and through the State of Maryland funding, and long story short, about $12.8 million was deployed to our about, about 1,200 or so businesses in Wicomico County in the past year alone. We, are, we do have um, three uh, grant programs open now. And it's on our website at sweed.org, S-W-E-D.org. I think our economic development coordinator is with us today. Is Zach? Is Zach here? There he is. I thought you'd be here. Um, see Zach. Zach Prabula is doing is our coordinator. He's doing a great job. He's overseeing quarterback these later latest programs. So um, contact Zach. He, he's got he's, he's he's a good contact. So the pandemic in, uh, impacted unevenly and as horribly as some people have fared in this pandemic, others have done pretty well. And it's that consumer spending right now that's really driving our local economy. And as a result of being forced to stay home for a period of time, a couple rounds of tax refunds, a couple rounds of stimulus checks, and that consumer spending, you know, pent up demand, and you put all that together, and some of these projects that consumers have put off, like remodeling or purchasing cars, purchasing homes, are, are backed with a vengeance, and the rate structure is helping that. Business spending seems to be lagging a little bit, but one would expect that to pick up throughout the course of the year. As uh, conferences like this are now in person, I'm going to one in June, and that's in person. So it's nice to see trade events and conferences and businesses wanting to send cost, uh, their, their salespeople out to meet with their supply chain, their customers, uh, other ancillary type uh, facilities. So you would think business spending would uh, pick up uh, throughout the, as the year progresses. So what's it mean for us on a local basis? If it was a tight labor market prior to the pandemic, it's probably even tighter at this point in time. The unemployment rate today in Wicomico is about 6.9%, you know, way, way above the 4% uh, in this time uh, last year. But I don't think there's a real whole lot of difference between the 4% and the 6% or 4% and the 7% unemployment rate these days. The demand for talent and trying to attract talent to your organization is as great today as it's ever been. It will continue to be so, I believe. Residential uh, construction is driving a lot of our economy today in Wicomico County. It's something we haven't seen in years, a decade, 15 years since the, since the Great Recession. And prior to the Great Recession, this is 05, 06, you saw a lot of subdivision activity for residential construction in Wicomico. And since then, you have seen very little, in fact, zero 
And those lots that were subdivided years ago that sat dormant for 10, 12, 15 years, right through some subdivisions in Wicomic County, and look at the construction that's happening. We did about 200 and some homes last year, compared to about 100 the year before, and I know uh, Bill will talk a little bit more, Sussex uh, is on fire as well, but it's that rate structure, and in Wicomico, it's a lack of inventory. We have less than 200 homes on the market, and that's about a one and a half month uh, absorption rate, and it's easy for me to say, so for some of my real estate friends out there, because I don't have to sell homes for a living, but you'd really want to see that uh, absorption rate get up to like three, four months, and three or 400 homes on the market. So. The sales are hot. If you're a seller, it's a strong seller's market right now. You would, one might expect that to moderate a little bit throughout the course of the year simply because of a lack of inventory. In other words, if we had more homes to sell, we'd sell more. So the sales would probably be at least strong throughout the course of the year, perhaps moderate a, uh, a little bit. From a real, real, real estate again, from an industrial standpoint, the market's been hot for about nine months, uh, 10 months as companies seek to decentralize operations, become more resilient, more diversified, especially in the supply chain. And we're getting calls that, Dave, we need 100,000 square feet, Dave, we need 150,000 square feet, Dave, we need 89,000 square feet, whatever that is. And the answer is yes, or the answer is no. The speed to market, is overriding any patience any of us have to create or build to suit uh, projects. And uh, so that uh, our uh, challenge going forward is to figure out how to construct or develop new industrial space on the market, either uh, new construction or repurposing existing space. We're not a large office market in Wicomico, but you can bet as companies bring people back to work, there's, there'll be a, a new option. Uh, it's a hybrid remote working option, so it will be more prevalent going in, uh, in, into the future, and why not? We're a whole lot better at it. We've had a year's practice. We're much more sophisticated at uh, remote working and remote uh, conferencing than we've, than we've had ever been before. Uh, the pandemic accelerated the challenges, I think, in the retail sector. And look no further than our center at Salisbury. It's our million square foot regional mall. Uh, that changed hands about a month two months ago, and there is some large box space uh, available. So 130, 140,000 square feet, the former Sears, former Macy's, I referred to that. That uh, on a positive side, an optimistic side, it prevents, uh, presents an opportunity for repurposing that space, and um, especially in a, a really hot uh, last mile warehouse type uh, environment. So we, th we see opportunity there. You'll see new manufacturers and more uh, niche-oriented man manufacturers show up in Wicomico County this year. Um, small startup businesses that can, can grow, and if you think about it, every business out there at one time was a startup, but there'll be a multi multitude of uh, companies uh, start in Wicomico County, the life science sector, which uh, both human and health, um, these, are, these are Purdue, these are uh, Cadista Pharmaceuticals, and Zoetis, and Tishkan, and Trinity, and some more. Uh, strong growth potential in our microwave uh, component sector. These are K&L and uh, uh, Millennium, and um, um, we've got three or four, um, uh, Smith's Interconnect and Relcom, Clearcom, and, and more. That f deployment of 5G technology, that bodes well for, for our future, too. So the manufacturing sector looks, looks strong going forward. Downtown Salisbury is looking great. If you haven't been downtown Salisbury lately, to ride through. The city has invested millions of dollars in new businesses locating there and providing that platform for future growth. So all in all, the economy looks pretty strong. And if you couple that, eventually it'll get back to where we were pre-pandemic, right? With grounded in agriculture and poultry and healthcare, education is solid foundation. You throw in that uh, microwave sector and the uh, a life science sector, and then our key is how do we identify additional economic sectors for the sustainable economic development uh, sectors for our future. And uh, so we'll look at the, uh, the assets that we have, natural resources, we'll look at the airport, we'll look at other assets like the port, we're finishing up a port study, and all of those I think will lead to identifying new economic sectors in which we can uh, exploit for future growth. And the more we can do that, the more diversified our economy will be, the more resilient we'll be for whatever disruption may come our way in the future. So, great to be with you today. Thanks for having me. And now I'll uh, turn it over to Melanie.
I want to be like Dave, <laughs> be able to rattle all that off. That's fantastic. Um, and it's funny you mentioned about the restaurants. We were out Friday night in Ocean City. We had to go to three different places um, to actually get in. It was still about an hour wait at the Hobbit. So um, definitely things are, are getting back to normal and very exciting. Um, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about um, some of the initiatives, challenges, and opportunities that we have here in Worcester County. Um, but we're also reintroducing ourselves. Um, And I was kind of joking, I saw our old logo up there, I have to get Bill our new logo for next year. So <laughs> even in the midst of this tremendous pandemic, um, we really took the opportunity to kind of dig in and reevaluate ourselves, rebrand ourselves and align ourselves. Um, so about a year and a half ago, the departments of tourism, economic development, and um, parks and recreation really kind of joined forces. And we initiated a rebranding process. And I'm not going to read all this, but really it was an opportunity for us to, um, to change, to uh, again reintroduce ourselves to the region, and to be very strategic in how we um, attract visitors, how we attract new business development, business retention, et cetera. Um, and with that, there was multiple changes throughout the year, um, and the reorganization that ultimately took place was the uh, merger of the tourism and, uh, um, and economic development departments, and we have since brought on a business development and retention specialist, a workforce engagement specialist, and a marketing and advertising specialist. So we feel like we got all our bases covered, especially in Worcester County, which is truly a tourism-based economy. And again, with our new mission, um, with all of our departments working together, you know, it's a unified effort moving forward to attract visitors and again, business retention and investment. I am going to focus today on uh, tourism. I think that you know all of us have seen you know the the different activity, um, and I think you know Mema and, and Danny did a great job, um, and we see a lot of those things here locally, especially with hospitality and tourism. And when I started looking at actually some of the facts and figures, it really kind of um, you know it blows you away. You know, pre-pandemic was probably one of our best years in tourism, and. Um, I think because um, we are in a, a rural area with a massive resort, um, we have our small towns, we have wonderful um, natural assets, um, in addition to our other sectors, you know, with uh, manufacturing production, farming, fishing, forestry, professional business services, and healthcare. Um, where we saw, I think, the biggest hit was in our tourism and hospitality sector. Um, and that, again, those, those codes are really tied to um, retail, restaurant, hotel, amusements. You know, there's a number of different um, specific businesses that are tied to the sector. In terms of numbers, I'm just going to spout out a couple. Um, just with lodging alone, we saw about a 17% decrease. Restaurant, about a 12.6% decrease. And that's from July to December of 2020. So again, um, these numbers sometimes are you know, hard, hard to get in real time. But I think next year, we're going to truly see um, what the impact has been on the tourism industry. But with that, we're seeing tremendous potential and hope. Um, we talk about innovation. Um, I have been thoroughly impressed uh, working the past year with the businesses and seeing how they've adapted. Nobody wants to hear the word pivot anymore, I know. <laughs> but just seeing how they've adapted. Um, again, as we've administered, and I'll talk a, bit, a little about some of the grants we've administered through the office, you know, adding um, the rooftop decks, being able to um, uh, do the outdoor dining, expand their operations, the carry out, um, and then with retail and the hotels, um, really um, being able to maintain their COVID protocols and make our guests feel safe when they come. And we're definitely seeing that pay off for sure. In terms of uh, challenges and opportunities, and I think this is going to be an ongoing theme this uh, entire morning, is workforce. Um, we know it's a national issue. Um, here it is a, it's a paralyzing issue. Um, we are very concerned. Um, last year, our business owners were, you know, waiting tables and cleaning rooms. Um, this year, I think that pent-up demand that we keep talking about is going to really, really come forth. So we are working with our partners, the chamber, the hotel association, um, the state um, department of labor, um, to really try to come up with some um, solutions to this. It's going to be an ongoing thing and a long-term effort, I believe. Um, you know, we're even having a, a job fair you know, next, in a couple of weeks here, uh, 
unheard of. Usually everybody's full by now. So this again is, is, a, is a national trend, but here locally, especially in our hospitality and tourism based um, economy, it is very, very concerning. Um, of course, the transportation. You know, we're trying to get people in um, within a 30 mile radius to work at the jobs um, here, either in the north end with hospitality and tourism, or even getting folks from, you know, uh, Somerset County to come up and maybe work at Hardwire. So transportation is definitely an issue. And I know Shore Transit's here and Brad, and he's been a great partner working with us um, with with putting together a team of people that have really over the, even pre-COVID trying to come up with some of these solutions um, we talked a little bit about you know implementing the alternative ways of servicing customers and then probably one of our number one challenges is is broadband and that's something that I'm learning quite a bit about in my new position here um, so I know that our county is is has been working on that for years Tri-County Council um, Greg Padgham is incredibly well versed in that and so I look forward to working together not only with our governmental agencies but our private sector to move forward and, and give that accessibility that we need and I know my husband is an IT specialist for our Board of Education, and never more than ever have I understood how important broadband is and access um, with, with all these kids having to work from iPads for the past year. So we're excited to see them back, um, you know, most of them back in school. Um, in terms of our unique opportunities, of course, NASA Wallops, um, the Pocomoke Industrial Park, um, we've seen Hardwire really do some amazing things. There's some other growth that we're seeing down there. So we're going to really um, use that as an opportunity. Um, as we attract new businesses and new investment to Worcester County. Um, quality of life, we have one of the top rated school systems here in Worcester County. Um, really proud um, that my kids get to go there and I know many of you and you know, a number of blue ribbon schools, you know, they're just really impressive and I think that's an attractive um, asset we have in, in terms of bringing in new doctors to our hospital, you know, bringing in new businesses that want to maybe put another location, et cetera. So we're really using that as one of our um, unique opportunities. We have arts and entertainment districts in two of our small towns in Berlin um, and in uh, Snow Hill, and that is something that is uh, very unique and will help to grow our small businesses downtown um, in terms of uh, allowing people to to have that, you know, ability to exempt them from the from the tax from their income tax. Um, in terms of the geographic location, and we talked a bit, little bit about this, and, and Susan and I were over there kind of laughing because that has been our mantra, really, the fact that we are a drive-to destination. Um, people can work remotely from here. They want to come down and either play for a week and still work from their hotel room, or if they want to live here and work remotely. Those types of opportunities are um, absolutely something that we're going to capitalize on. And then just really delivering um, excellent customer service, um, looking at the experiences that visitors can have, the pent-up demand we talked about, and then really working with our partners for strategic um, you know, solutions, again, to the workforce issues, um, product development, and business development. Um, and I won't go through the exact numbers, but we have administered about $10.5 million in grants so far. And right when I started um, in the combined department back in um, about November is when we got our first round of the, the hotel and lodging and the restaurant. And then we had since got a few more rounds. And then, of course, um, it's been such a pleasure to help these businesses. And it, it, it almost brings tears to your eyes when they call you and say, oh, my gosh, this small grant just helped me keep somebody on board. Or it helped me you know, open when I couldn't open for another couple weeks. So that's something that we've been really honored to be able to facilitate through our office and our very small office and our very green office so it's been it's been really a learning process for us and then of course the rescue plan funds that we're all going to be figuring out how we're going to allocate through the counties and through the municipalities um, in terms of current initiatives moving forward this is our proud piece that actually I have about 50 or so out on the table if anybody would like to pick it up it's our choose Maryland's coast we call it our sizzle piece um, it's really being able to um, showcase some of the businesses that have taken advantage of you know vote loan of some of the tax incentives the um, opportunity zone so we're really trying to showcase the personality of Worcester County and use that to attract new businesses and as well as the retention piece um, I know when we presented a lot of our new branding efforts out in the community um, through through tourism and economic development a lot of people were like wow I'm very proud to live here I'm very proud to have a business here so that's kind of the idea um, to use that as well as to attract new businesses um, we talked a lot about um, agriculture earlier and I think um, we are actually looking at trying to amend um, our code in Worcester County to make agritourism businesses um, more, make it a more attractive place for that. We've already got a few on-farm breweries, wineries, and distilleries, you know, wedding venues, uh, you pick, um, 
hay rides, things like that, you know, being able to allow our farmers and our agricultural community to diversify. So that's something that we're actually very um, you know, aggressively working on with our team. Um, the other thing, we talked about workforce. About a year or so ago, even pre-COVID, um, our department started talking about um, really still focusing on STEM initiatives with our youth, but really also looking at really how our economy is truly made up. So skilled trades, agriculture, and tourism, and then adding that T on there for technology. So we're looking at um, putting on a, a, a wonderful program this summer and then moving forward working with our tech school, our Worcester Tech School, as well as our Board of Education to be able to help create that pipeline for the types of um, jobs that we need here in Worcester County. Um, of course, um, if anybody's read in the paper, we've got our paddle wheeler coming, hopefully in a couple weeks. That's going to be a nice economic driver for Snow Hill. And the sports marketing is another big initiative that we're working on, hopefully moving forward towards a, a sports complex that can attract um, a number of um, youth sports, amateur sports, and then working, of course, with Wicomico County um, and a lot of the programs that are already in place with USSA softball, and just giving more um, assets that we can offer out into the, um, that market. You know, it's a very attractive market and a very lucrative market. Um, again, talking about workforce development pre uh, preference or um, presence, um, infrastructure with broadband and then we are working on this really fantastic new um, uh, it's really a, a, a data platform so we can actually make some decisions for economic development advertising and marketing we can look at heat maps of um, origin markets where people are coming from to Worcester County if they're staying in Ocean City how they're moving around the county if they live in the south end where are they working so these are some really cool um, you know innovative things that we're working with to help share with our partners to make decisions and then to be able to propel forward and we're very very optimistic so um, and then I'm just going to kind of flip through these in spite of COVID these are the list of businesses that have either made an investment um, made a change started a new business or or really um, you know been able to, to move forward through COVID and, and I was really shocked when I saw some of these because um, again and we hope that it, like Danny or um, Dave said hopefully it's some of the grant monies that we've been able to facilitate to help them to this especially some of the um, the expansion the renovations and so forth and then here's Berlin, Snow Hill, and Pocomoke. And I'm just going to leave you with looking ahead. Um, the pent-up demand, again, we're going to see a, a tremendous season, I think, here in 2021. Um, retail and office, we're seeing some new shopping centers that are in the queue um, in, in development. Mm -hmm. Healthcare, of course, that corridor on 589 with um, Atlantic General and Tidal Health, those developments we're going to see down the pike. Um, the downtowns are coming back to life. You know, main streets are able to do events. Um, we're seeing people that are out and about, and it's just been really exciting to see kind of this recovery, and we're looking forward to it. Um, and then finally, this beautiful facility that you're in, um, meetings and conventions, they're finally coming back. We had a meeting last night with our sales and marketing team, and um, we think we have an opportunity and that people might not want to do a big convention down in a downtown major metro. They might want to come to a place like Ocean City and Worcester County and be able to spread out and have more um, activities to do out into the natural environment. So we're going to look at that as an opportunity as well. So with that, that's all I have. Thank you. Stay seated if that's okay. Um, good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, this is, it's also kind of strange to see everybody out there. The last big presentation that I did was for the forecast in 2019 at SU, so it's kind of full circle, and hopefully we're moving in the right direction. Can you hear me now? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I've got a lot of ground to cover. I'm gonna go over CARES grants, a new initiative, some of our marketing. I'm gonna to touch on the seafood and cannabis industries, and then I'm gonna highlight a few projects. Okay. It's been a tough year, um, but considering the economy, things could be a lot worse. Our unemployment numbers show that we're climbing our way back. We're at 6.6%, and at the height of the recession in 2010, we were at 14. Most of our large employers were deemed essential and were able to continue work. We've even had some logistics businesses that have done better in the pandemic. Our larger revitalization projects have continued to move forward. 
Our office has worked closely with several partners, including the Health Department, Emergency Operations. The majority of our time was spent on information sharing, working on the CARES grants, and planning for recovery. We work with the Chamber, Tourism, City Economic Development, SBDC, and Main Street. These partners also helped us get through the grant applications, which was a huge undertaking. We gave out approximately 3.7 million in CARES and state grants. We've assisted over 300 businesses and nonprofits. Our top five grant recipients by industry were restaurants, ag and fisheries, retail and miscellaneous, which included hair salons, there were several of them, construction, arts, entertainment, and recreation. Most of our grants went to small businesses averaging between four and five employees, and the average grant amount was $9,000. We worked with the local management board, Meals Till Monday, Midshore Pro Bono. We helped with rental assistance, YMCA, several youth groups, and churches in the county. The community uh, played a big role in our CARES grants and strengthened our response by assisting us in determining who and where the vulnerable populations were. Access to the right data is imperative during disasters. That's why I'm really excited to announce a project that's been underway for the last nine months. This is a large collaborative project funded by an Economic Adjustment Assistance Grant through the EDA. It's managed by the Midshore Regional Council and Tri-County Council of the Lower Shore in partnership with Caroline, Dorchester, and Talbot Counties, the Eastern Shore Regional GIS Cooperative, the Upper Shore Workforce Investment Board, and the Lower Shore Workforce Alliance. Working from the resiliency plans in the SEDS, which is the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy, critical information will be gathered and analyzed to better understand the economic impact of the pandemic and future events. The ESRGC is creating tools that will include a hub site and several data dashboards. These public-facing tools will provide crucial insights into our community and will provide decision makers with data to promote a better understanding of the threats, opportunities, and potential impacts to economic recovery in our communities. Some of these resources will be available in the next couple months, so stay tuned, more to come. Um, it would be really great maybe at the next forecast if it can be highlighted. So while we were working on grants and the recovery project, we continued to market the county. This is one of the ads that went out last spring that was targeted towards DC and Baltimore uh, markets for attraction. When you clicked on the ad, it took you to a landing page on our website where you'd find nine ways to find your space in Dorchester. Whether you wanted to start a business or dine by the docks, we have space for you. The idea behind the campaign was to stay relevant. People are looking for space and we have it. The tourism office also put out ads on MPT and other news media platforms. So we were able to gather some visitor information. The Bill Burton Fishing Pier, which is the old Chop Tank, uh, Chop Tank River Bridge, had 114,000 visitors in 2020 compared to 53,000 in 2019. The Yacht Basin had 110 transient boat visits in July 2020 compared to 74 in July 2019. The Tubman Visitor Center was closed, but we estimate thousands of visitors to the mural. And Blackwater Wildlife's Drive had 130,000 drivers in 2020 compared to 71,000 in 2019. We also followed housing. We had 517 homes sold in the county in 2020 compared to 435 in 2019. The average price was 240,000 in 2020 compared to 205,000 in uh, 2019. And the first quarter is actually looking good of this year. We've had um, 134 houses sold compared to 93 in the first quarter of last year with a 13% increase in selling price. However, there's a lack of inventory, no supply, and plenty of buyers. The exact opposite of the seafood industry. Plenty of supply and no buyers. The seafood industry had a tough year. Restaurant closures, supply chain disruptions, pre-existing labor shortages that were magnified by the pandemic, the H2B lottery, and COVID breakouts. Some crab um, producers were able to change their sales strategy from restaurants to direct to consumer, 
Oyster sales were down as well. We have 658 licensed watermen in the county and many were in trouble without avenues to sell their harvest. I spoke with a few owners that are cautiously optimistic this year. The salinity looks good, so the hatchery manager at Hornpoint is excited about a, you know, a full production year for their oysters. The recent announcement of the additional H2B visas is great news. Mm -hmm. But, like one owner said, I'm not a gambling man. I've never played the lottery, yet I have to operate my business in a lottery system with no guarantee of opening. I'm hopeful for a permanent solution so we don't have to risk gambling away one of our most prized possessions. Speaking of prized possessions, let's talk about cannabis. The Eastern Shore Innovation Center received another Rural Maryland grant that is assisting in both the expansion of the wet lab and SunX Analytical's capabilities to increase production. New equipment is gonna enable SunX to mass produce uh, their current products and expand into new areas like gel caps and gummy edibles. Calta continues to grow. They were recently highlighted in Cheddar News, which is really exciting. They have about 130 employees and they hope to be at 200 by this time next year. All their jobs are living wage. They have health and 401k benefits. We expect the industry to keep growing in the coming years. Now I'm going to talk about a couple projects. So this is a um, packing house project. It consists of about 60,000 square feet, and it's currently under renovation. Um, it's a mix of office, retail, restaurant, and oyster bar, a two-story atrium um, that'll be for public and private events, and a commercial kitchen. Uh, the cannery park and rails to trails at the back of the building continues. Um, there's gonna be 125 parking spaces, and the first tenant is planned to move in this fall. That is the uh, new freestanding medical facility, University of Maryland Shore Regional Health. The building should be completed by July 15th, and at that point, they're gonna take medical equipment inside, take care of everything, and hopefully have an opening date at sep of September 15th. So in closing, it's been a challenging year, but our community is resilient. We've had brave businesses open downtown. Our, our smaller businesses have learned to adapt and become more flexible. Our larger businesses continue to hire, even though there's a struggle there, and make the necessary changes to thrive in this new economy. Our Route 50 corridor is under continuous improvement thanks to the Cambridge Marketplace and Dorchester Marketplace. Overall, I think we're moving in the right direction, and I hope we can all take steps to a full recovery. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Bill Bill Chambers for the uh, for the invite, and uh, it's always a pleasure to come here. And uh, uh, these ED colleagues here, man, are unsung heroes because the money that they gave out in a short amount of time when everybody was still scrambling, uh, the country and the world was really shut down in March. Uh, and if you gauged, uh, it used to be from the old school, it was like you gauge somebody's, uh, how busy they were based on how many miles they put on their car. Well, we probably didn't put that many miles on our car, but my phone was just blowing up, man. I mean, it was like, it was constantly on charger. So. Uh, I just want to give a, we, we all, we, we, we had no magic wand, so Dave would call me up, Melanie, Susan, everybody would call up and say, hey man, what are you going to do, what are you looking at, and uh, so thank you guys for all your support behind the scenes uh, to really <clears throat> minimize as what we could, as best we could, uh, the COVID pandemic uh, process. Uh, I will echo with, uh, there was uh, three things that happened uh, uh, we actually, one of the rounds that came out, uh, actually the way our checks came out uh, was the week right before Christmas. And uh, I felt like Santa Claus. And I don't have my kids home anymore. And, you know, the grandkids are getting older and, and stuff. And uh, so we, we made it a point uh, to go out. And uh, we spent three days 
uh, going around and delivering uh, checks. And three of those, one of them, uh, they had just lost their grandfather, uh, so they had to shut down for like three or four days, and he'd, he had passed because of COVID. Another one had had a heart attack. Uh, don't know if it was COVID-related or not. And then another one, a lady said, uh, she just broke down and said, I don't know how I was going to pay my rent. Uh, and she was just elated. And so that's some of the stories, man. You, how do you put that in the slide? I don't know. Uh, if you figure it out, let me know. But uh, those kind of things are real stuff. So I want to thank uh, uh, Bill and the ED partners. I uh, also want to thank Bill for all the, uh, the Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce, uh, all the restaurant relief Zoom calls that you were putting on, man, you know, week after week, and a lot of us were on those calls. Uh, we're, we're a small staff, a small county, uh, just don't have those resources, Bill. So uh, thanks to uh, Salisbury Area Chamber of Commerce and you for uh, putting those on and allowing us uh, to participate. Uh, most of all, I want to thank uh, the Salisbury Chamber for uh, Somerset County had been working on natural gas. Uh, Rich, I haven't forgot you down there in Acomac. And uh, we've been working on natural gas. Uh, I've been working on it for uh, 17 years myself as a staff member, uh, another five years as a board member, and I don't know how long before that. Uh, but anyway, uh, we, were, we were concerned in Somerset we did not have natural gas, uh, and we were concerned that, uh, you know, the, there was a lot of uh, you know, push back on it, and uh, you know, in a in a basketball game or a soccer game, you know, there's momentum shifts, and uh, I saw the shift from a natural gas to Somerset or to Wicomico County. Mike Dunn, I don't know if Mike's here, but Greater Salisbury, and the, they organized a uh, a thing on natural gas, and they had different speakers. Uh, come in. I think I saw uh, my friend Jim Mathias from uh, the university uh, was here. Yep, Jim's there. And uh, the UMES team were on that. And uh, I see, yep, yep, Dr. Anderson's husband there. So anyway, uh, I don't think, uh, I don't know where it would have went, but I know the momentum shifted uh, from that call, Bill. So, uh, and with that, it was approved at their January meeting. Uh, if you drive uh, into Somerset County, you see those pipelines. Uh, I know Dave does because he goes down and plays golf uh, down there. And uh, so anyway, great hope. One of the, oh, that's right. That's right. I forgot. Yeah. Yeah. He just going through to see his uh, wife's family. I think that's what it was. Uh, but anyway, so anyway, thanks for that. Uh, so with that, uh, now I'm going to hit my buddy, good buddy over here. I don't know his name yet, but anyway, he's going to take care of me. I want you to, it's about a minute and 45 seconds. So anyway, thank you, thank you. So first of all, 
How many people from Somerset County here? Okay. You didn't see that, okay? You didn't see that. Okay, all right, all right, all right. And it's out there. It's, it's out there. So, uh, lo and behold, we, uh, uh, we got this. Uh, Dave would remember this, and uh, 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 your predecessor uh, is either Mary or Catherine. I can't remember which one. But uh, the MEDA, uh, Maryland Economic Development Association, a few years ago, uh, they had partnered with PNC Bank, and we received some funding. Uh, and so we could kind of do, you know, what we wanted. So everybody had different things. And, and man, we don't, we, we don't have the marketing money, the, the dollars, right? So uh, I told Lee, my secretary, I said, man, I, I, want, I want what they got, man. I mean, they put this stuff out there. It looks good, you know. And uh, so anyway, we started this initiative, and uh, Jim, we collaborated with uh, the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, uh, Alyssa Carr, uh, also uh, Tony Wig, uh, with uh, I think he lives in Berlin. And uh, so anyway, we put this thing together. Well, we were we were just about ready, and March it, and so this thing was just shut down, man. And it was like we had all this other stuff we had to do, and so anyway, I said. Uh, I said, Lee, get back on that, man. Let's get, let's get this back on track. So she started back again about January, after the first of the year. And so I get this email from, uh, from her Sunday night. And uh, Tony, I was in the chain, but I wasn't really commenting. And uh, she says to Tony, she says, man, if you can get this done, we, can, we might be able to have it for the, his speech on Wednesday. I was like, yeah, man. So anyway, uh, we got it. I haven't even ran it by anybody yet. The tourism people don't know it. The county commissioners don't know it, you know, and all like that. But show a lot of love, man. If you see me in the hot seat, just show me a lot of love because ain't nobody out there knows what's going on. So, but anyway, I'm excited about it. So, uh, so anyway, that's, uh, that's a little uh, thing. You'll see it. We'll start promoting that. We'll be working with uh, the tourism department uh, for Somerset County. And we'll make sure, now that it's on Facebook, uh, we'll make sure that Bill has it and they, he can sh and share it so it'll get out there. So uh, we had our, uh, we originally had scheduled our annual meeting in uh, December. Uh, we normally hold a, a, a little bit bigger uh, a meeting in December. It's like a year-end wrap-up. But we postponed it because, uh, 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 and we did it in March. We did it about the middle of March of this year. And uh, we had about maybe 60, 70 people there. And uh, a lot of the guys that have been around, uh, uh, said it was probably one of the best meetings uh, that they'd been to. And uh, this is coming right out of the pandemic. And uh, here's some of the projects. Uh, and most of these projects, some of them, the seeds were planted pre, pre pandemic, but a lot of them materialized in the summer of last year. Uh, some of them were just Zoom calls, some people coming in. But anyway, uh, the natural gas was the big one, uh, Mount Air was a big participant. I know UMES, ECI, uh, we have a big energy project that's gonna be going on in the center of the county. Uh, the developers are coming in uh, three to four days uh, next week uh, to meet with planning and zoning and go through that building, the final stages of that building permits. They'll start uh, building that. Uh, it's over a $200 million project. Uh, it's a big, big project, one of the biggest uh, probably since uh, uh, ECI was probably built in Somerset. You'll, you'll hear more about that. Uh, in Crisfield, uh, down in Crisfield, we had uh, the Carver Hall was a surplus piece of property that they had declared, and uh, that was went out to bid. Uh, Element MD, which is a cannabis uh, operation, they're looking at doing cultivation there. Uh, they also had, they've already purchased a building in Princess Anne, so they're kind of splitting up between north and south. That's going to be a processing facility. Uh, right around the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we had finished a lot. We had worked out a thing with Sage Policy Group, Audubon Basu. Many of you uh, know him from uh, speaking <coughs> engagements. Uh, he's one of Memo's uh, counterparts. And they were the successful uh, awardee on doing a, uh, a study for, in particular, the lower part of Somerset County. Uh, that study came out, but we actually had to bring it out virtually because we couldn't do uh, all that. And, and one of the components of that study was some demolition of old buildings. Uh, that's already began. The city is starting to implement some of those uh, strategies in their planning. Uh, Rubber set, which we know is Sherwin-Williams and Chrisfield. 
they had, I talked to the president uh, there, they have, actually have a new gentleman on that's now. Uh, he told me that it's the busiest year they've had on record. Uh, and these home projects, you know, the paint rollers and everybody was staying home, man, and, uh, and you got the honeydew list and man, everybody's painting. So the roller, I mean, so they, they have literally gone from 180 to 220. Uh, as we speak, they're going to be at 260 by the end of the summer. They want to be at 300 by the end of the year. Uh, uh, Tidal Health, uh, good friends of Tidal Health, and I think they're a sponsor here. I think they're actually on, on a panel a little bit later. Uh, they are looking to build a new facility. I've been working with Chris uh, uh, for Tidal Health, and they um, uh, will be starting construction uh, and I don't know if it's going to be, I think it's the fall or uh, winter of this year. Uh, it's a $20 million facility that will be in the Hopewell area just on the outskirts of Chrisfield. Uh, we've got, uh, I, th I think I saw Brett here, Brett Davis. Brett, you here, man? Davis Strategy. Uh, uh, he's your landlord. Isn't that right? Okay. Yeah. And so Dave introduced me to him, man. And uh, so we, you know, we just joke back and forth a little bit. Uh, these guys are, have been very valuable uh, to Somerset County. We need that public-private partnership. We need that catalyst. And so they have came in. They uh, brought in some uh, 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 fresh ideas and all. So they're looking at the downtown area of Princess Anne. They've already started uh, that, that there. They've been looking at Chrisfield. Now they have like a, a fiber uh, project that they're looking on in the Main Street right in uh, Princess Anne for those that want to uh, telework and all. So uh, thank you, uh, Brett, for that. Uh, and because of that action, we had uh, a job fair, uh, you know, down in Crisfield, and we did it about two weeks ago. Now, th this, is, this is Crisfield now. I mean, you know, population 2,500, right? You know, the whole county's 27,000. Uh, there were 400 jobs open. I mean, Purdue came down, they, you know, that Purdue came down. Handy's, Handy's is a seafood business. They, they're looking, it's a year-round operation now. Uh, they want to, they could hire 30 people on the spot today. Uh, that's right down there. I've already mentioned uh, Rebel Set, Rebel Set, Tidal Health was there at the job fair. Uh, and we were just, they were, they were excited about the job fair. They didn't really know, uh, you know, how it was going to turn out, but it was a good day. They want to do it again. Uh, we did it on a Friday and Saturday. So uh, thanks to our partners, uh, LESWA, Lower Shore Workforce Alliance, they brought down the, uh, the mobile unit uh, that they do that you couldn't go on it, but if you needed internet or copies or something like that to facilitate, big thank you uh, to them. Uh, in the Princess Anne Industrial Park, uh, Bomar, uh, a cabinet company went out of business right at the beginning of the pandemic and it was just because not because of the pandemic it was just uh, a family uh, type business and they were just ready to to like that was the opportunity to uh, to move uh, retire and it went on the market uh, in less than two weeks I think uh, Spiri Van Ness I had it listed and I think in less than uh, two weeks they had three full offers uh, on that uh, on that property uh, they've gone in and uh, they're doing some renovations there. Um, another piece of property at the left uh, was purchased uh, around November, December uh, of that year. It's about 11 acres in the Princess Anne Industrial Park. Uh, an energy company came in and bought two or three lots in there. Uh, I mentioned Element ND. They came in and bought a vacant building that, that settled. They'll be doing their processing facility there. Uh, that's where Dave, uh, uh, Brett Davis and his team are looking at doing some fiber stuff in there as well. Uh, see what else we got. And then uh, on one of the last things, uh, just this past couple weeks, uh, uh, Spiri Van Ness, uh, uh, I think his name is uh, Andy, Andy Ball, uh, they, they uh, uh, brokered a deal a little place uh, down in Fairmount, it's called Hideaway Grill. Uh, some of you may have gone by boat, some of you drive down. It's a nice little place out there, and uh, uh, actually an Ocean City team and a Salisbury. They have uh, places in Salisbury and in Wicomico. Uh, so now, now they're in the Tri-County area, and uh, so they got, got one there. So 
Anyway, that's, that's pretty much it. I will say that uh, one of the things that the next growth, uh, Dave always does a nice job. I've always envied uh, uh, the stats on housing, and, and he told me a long time ago, man, housing is really, you know, that you, you wouldn't believe how that really increases economic wealth and growth and, and stuff. And we've not experienced that that much in Somerset. Most of people uh, uh, just have chose not to, to live, th live there. So I could go back, uh, I, didn't, I didn't get put them st stats out because uh, they weren't you know, really great stats, right? Uh, but I was sitting in a meeting, we were meeting with a developer that were coming in and uh, one of the things, uh, it was actually, uh, I take that back, it wasn't a developer, it was the new town manager for Princess Anne that was in there and we were all doing a round table, planning and zoning was there and one of the individuals shared about housing permits for new, new construction. Now this was in about March of this year. And in years past, 15, 10, right? In the first quarter, and the quarter wasn't even over yet, they had 30 permits that were drawn for construction. I was like, hold it, I, did I, hold it, you, you can talk about the last year or something. Like that. No, she said the first quarter of this year. So that, that potential there, that growth, that economic engine, it's going to look a little bit different than, uh, you know, what we've seen uh, in years past. But uh, I'm excited about it. Uh, MEDA, Maryland Economic Development Association, had a, uh, their, their spring conference yesterday. They had J.P. Morgan, uh, Jim Glassman that was on there, and he, he made a statement that uh, he's looking at the, he thinks by year end, that we will be about where we were pre-pandemic. Uh, and so a lot, and a lot of that could be on the housing side and stuff like that. So uh, send people, if you got any family out there, any high school, college kids needs a job, with all due respect, I normally get along with my panel, but please send them to Somerset first, you know, and all like that. So anyway, thank you very much and have a great day. Good morning. Uh, my name's Bill Poff, and I'm the Director of Economic Development for Sussex County. Um, what I'd like, my approach here this morning, let's see. My approach here this morning is a little bit different than everyone else. Uh, do I have a, can I get a sense of how many in the audience is from Sussex County? Great. Well, we do have a few people from Sussex County. So what I'd like to go over today and cover is uh, Sussex County at a glance, the downtown development districts, our site Sussex loan program, project that we've been working on this past year during COVID as a kitchen incubator, talk a little bit about what's going on around Sussex County, and talking about Keep Sussex Strong. I'll end with that. Just like everyone else, uh, we everyone's had the same problem uh, this past year in terms of from a business standpoint. Everything was shut down in, in Delaware uh, for a period of time, and everything then was uh, uh, was reopened at a certain percentage, and the impact on those businesses there's no question has been pretty dramatic, but one of the things that I will tell you, um, I found in traveling the county, and again, it's a large county, uh, our sitting senator, U.S. Senator, he sells Sussex County as the largest county landmass wise to the east of the Mississippi. We have 25 incorporated towns in Sussex County pretty large. Uh, sometimes it takes me just to get from one end of the county to the other end, depending on the time of the year, can take me an hour and 15 minutes or longer. So I want to start with Sussex County as, at a glance, and we'll start my chart. I do apologize for the chart. I think um, 
it's a little bit hard to read in terms of the fine print, but currently the current population for Sussex County is around 250,000. Our medium priced home is 270,000. I'm in the center of the chart. We currently have 9,300 9, businesses in Sussex County and our day population is 243,000. So that gives you a sense that there's some out migration during the day, people that live in the county, but they're, but they're actually working out. Let's go counterclockwise, if you will. The medium age in the county is 47.9, The uh, growth rate from 2010 to uh, 2020 was 2.4%. Uh, medium household income is right around 60,000. Uh, the number of people per household is 2.4 people. And then the per capita income is about $34,000. Now, uh, the logo at the top left I'm gonna talk about uh, at the very end. This is a logo that we created during the pandemic. Uh, for our local businesses to keep Sussex strong. What we actually did is during the pandemic, we actually went out into the communities and we started filming the business community so that, so that we could send the message out to local people that local, locals buying locally matter. So that was a, a, an initiative we took this past year. Sussex County was not as lucky um, we were not as lucky as these counties that are sitting up here that we were able to give out money. If you know how the CARES Act worked, the CARES Act, you had to have a population of 500,000 or more to get direct money under the CARES Act. We only had one county in the state of Delaware that got direct funding under the CARES Act, and that was Newcastle County. Both Kent and Sussex County, we did not get money the money was given directly to the state and the state managed the fund. So what we did is we worked directly with the state of Delaware to help those businesses acquire funding or grant funding through the state. One of the things I wanted to share with you in terms of growth, and I have to tell you, from a growth standpoint, we have not missed a beat during COVID. From a building permit standpoint, and I'm gonna go back to 2018. From July of 18 to June of 19, we did 10,429 building permits. From July of 19 through June of 20, we did 10,733 building permits from July of 20 to June of 21, we're projecting we will do an excess of 12,000 building permits. Wow. Our growth rate in Sussex County has been pretty tremendous. Of those 12,000 building permits, 336 of those building permits were commercial projects. And a lot of those projects I've been working out of my office. Now, reassessment has been in the news throughout Delaware. It's been 50 years since Sussex County has gone through a reassessment. So there was a lawsuit brought against the state and each one of the counties to reassess and basically the reassessment benefits the school districts just to give you a sense of what the county operates off of we collect 16 million dollars of our tax bill goes to operate the county offices all other money comes from permit fees. 
So with reassessment, what will happen is, is that the schools will benefit from reassessment. The county will not benefit, but we will pay for reassessment. So that will take place and that will be put in place in 2024. Our council uh, voted on that two weeks ago to take the county through a reassessment uh, initiative. Not sure if, uh, if you're aware of it, but Delaware has a program called Downtown Development Districts. It uh, was organized by the state of Delaware. It's an urban redevelopment program to in encourage investment into small communities. There's 12 designated districts in the state. We have four of those districts in Sussex County. This program was created in 2015. $36 million has been spent of state funds, which leveraged $630 million worth of private investment into these 12 designated districts. Since the beginning, $18 in private investment was realized for every dollar that the state spent in this program. Now, eligible uses for this, uh, for construction activity is residential, mixed use, commercial, rehab existing buildings in downtown areas, and also new construction. Now, Sussex County, at the end of 2016, chose to get involved in the Downtown Development District program, meaning we were going to put money into the program. And I have it here since 2017. It was actually like December of 16 when it started. And this is grant money from the county. Sussex County has granted $301,000 to the Downtown Development District Program. So how that works is, is that if the state approves a project for one of the designated communities, we will match up to a certain dollar that in, in grant, and that actually comes through the Economic Development Office. And we have four in Sussex County, four Downtown Development Districts, Laurel, Seaford, Georgetown, and I do apologize I forgot to put Milford on there, and you know Milford is right on the line. Half of Milford is Sussex County, and half of Milford is Kent County, and that was an error on my part. But it's been a very successful program. The Excite Sussex Loan Program. Three and a half years ago, we created a loan program in the county to uh, attract and retain businesses in the county. It's a, right now, when we originally started, it was a $4 million revolving loan program. Within the last 30 days, we've added $12 million to the program because it's been successful. So we now have a $16 million revolving loan program targeted to business retention, and business attraction, if you will. So there's $12 million currently available. We used the first million dollar, $4 million up, and we partnered with uh, one of our banks in, in uh, uh, Delaware, Discover Bank. Uh, they've been our partner in this, and uh, we outsourced the management of our fund. Uh, when I came to the county, I started uh, we had a loan program and it was about $750,000 in the fund. And that fund had been in existence for about eight years. So what I discovered is that the county was not in the business to manage a loan portfolio. So what we did is we, we started looking outside the county to see who we could find that could manage a loan portfolio for us. So, uh, we uh, partnered with the National Development Council, the Grow America Fund, and they manage our loan port portfolio for us. Um, 
it's been very successful. Now, in terms of what we will lend for, we'll do uh, machinery and equipment. We'll fund that uh, up to 10 years. We'll do real estate and uh, renovations for 25 years. And we'll do tenant improvements to be paid over the ter term of the lease. And there's no application fee. What we use, and this is targeted to existing businesses, you must be in business at least two years in order to qualify for the, uh, the loan fund. What we use is tax returns and financials. We do not ask for a business plan. I wanted to share with you some examples of businesses that we funded through the fund. We've helped the paving company relocate to Georgetown, Delaware, um, that uh, retained and created jobs, and there was 25 jobs involved there. We have an LED lighting company that located in our Delaware Coastal Business Park, and uh, that business just opened up and there's 19 jobs there. We did attract a business from Pennsylvania, and they opened a second location. They bought the Allen Harim Hatchery in Seaford. And um, they just uh, actually opened up here within the last month. There's 21 jobs there. And we just closed on a loan last week. Uh, that's a company out of Millsboro, Delaware. And there's 66 jobs involved there. Now, um, the reason why we, you see this is Georgetown, Seaford, Millsboro. What we did when we created this loan fund, we created three economic development zones. One being on the western side of the county, that's the Nanakook zone, that runs from Greenwood down to Del Mar. Then we have the Indian River zone that runs from Selbyville up to Millsboro. And then we have the Broadkill Zone that actually is Georgetown, Ellendale, Milton, Harbison, so that actually runs over to Route 13. The goal with this fund is to really push economic development into those areas. As many of you know, the eastern side of the county has been an economic engine in its own right and it was on fire. There's no question that the pandemic did put stress on the eastern side of the county. It's one of the things that we as economic development directors always have to keep our eye on the prize. What can change? And we had the economic downturn 2008, 2009, I have to tell you, we didn't miss a beat on the eastern side of the county. But this did have an impact on the eastern side of the county, especially with our business community. Now, what makes this loan so attractive? The interest rate. It's fixed. It's fixed. Think of that person that's buying a building or renovating a building. We're going to fund that for 25 years. It's going to be a fixed rate. The current rate as of last week was 3.44% fixed, pretty attractive. Again, we're looking at job creation here, 10 jobs to 500 jobs. That's part of the parameters as well. But uh, I think it's probably the number one gem we have in our toolbox that we can offer businesses throughout the county. So uh, we're proud of it. Now, a project that we've been working on this past, year, or this past year is a kitchen incubator. As you know, Sussex County is known as the Culinary Coast, and they market themselves as the Culinary Coast. And what that has done, that has created a lot of opportunity for people that have an idea and they're working out of their home kitchen, or they think they have an idea and they need a space to actually to operate this business. And they need technical support. 
because it's all put together. So this kitchen incubator that we're working on, we have gotten some seed funding. We got $150,000 seed funding, so we have that set aside. We were in the queue to get another 150,000 this year. So we'll be in a position to either purchase a building or lease a building. We are currently looking at two facilities, one in the center of the county and the other one sort of midway uh, between the eastern side and the center of the county. So what is a kitchen incubator? And you, you may have a kitchen incubator here in, in Maryland, but I, I'm not, I, I know they're in DC, Boston, there's a, there's a lot of models that we've looked at across the country, but it's a shared licensed production kitchen. If anybody's in the restaurant business or want to be in the restaurant business or you're manufacturing jellies and jams or you're, you're, you're operating a, a bakery that may go to one of the farmer's market, you have to operate out of a licensed production kitchen. It helps remove any barriers of high cost investment. We will take care of that from the standpoint. We will make the investment in, into the uh, kitchen and uh, all the resources associated with it. With it. it allows foodpreneurs, and, and I just did a project and just spoke to a group of people and I used the word foodpreneurs, and somebody said, well, I don't even think that's a word. And I said, well, Google it, and you'll find out Wikipedia does, does use it. There's foodpreneurs out there, and you know farmers that want to do value-added products uh, caterers, food carts. One of the things, we have a huge number of food trucks in Sussex County, and we want that to be the commissary for, for uh, food trucks. We also think at the end of the day that uh, we can do some bulk buying that will allow some of these individuals be able to buy better. Uh, reduces the risk of failure by removing additional startup barriers associated with low skills in the aspects of managing and maintaining a commercial kitchen. It's not easy. It's not easy. So that, that we're going to take care of. The other, uh, the key piece of this is we're going to provide technical assistance and training and value added resources related to distribution, branding, marketing, food cost, insurance, any type of digital uh, services that may be available, we're going to offer that as a, as a uh, 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 service. Now, it doesn't come free if you're familiar with commercial kitchens. I mean, there, there is, we're, we're going to take memberships. So in order to use our commercial kitchen, you will become a member of the commercial kitchen, but at the same time, there will be a lease amount as well. And depending on which facility we end up picking, if we get the one facility, we hope to actually use some pop-up restaurants too along the way. That's probably phase two, where individuals that want to operate will, will do pop-ups as well. I'm getting the uh, word here. So other activities in Sussex County, healthcare. With the population growth, healthcare is growing. BB Hospital expanding. Bay Health, Tidal Health, Behavioral Health Services out of Georgetown, and the individuals that purchased the old Milford Bay Health, which is the Wil uh, Milford Wellness Village. We've been working pretty closely with them. Delaware Coastal Business Park, we just signed a contract with uh, an individual uh, two weeks ago on seven acres in our Delaware Coastal Business Park. It's the great uh, outdoor cottages. They will building, be building cottages for the RV industry throughout the country. And uh, if you've, that's sort of a hot market right now. It's one and two bedroom cottages and they'll be building them in our uh, park. Central Sussex County's on fire. I call that the new frontier, if you will. Uh, all you have to do is drive down 113 and you'll see, I mean, it, the whole corridor from Selbyville up to Georgetown is quite hot right now. Western Sussex County, uh, we made an investment in Western Sussex County 
in their Western Sussex business campus. We granted them $1.9 million economic development grant and they will be expanding their business park in Western Sussex County. And as many of you know, uh, Amazon Distribution Center will be opening up in the Seaford area as well. So the very last one is the video. This is the Keep Sussex Strong video. We've been videoing businesses throughout Sussex County and they've been telling us their experience through uh, COVID. One of the things that I have found has, uh, that is an amazement is these businesses throughout the shore here, not just Sussex County, County are resilient. They, they've reinvented themselves from a technology standpoint. If they thought they needed to be in the technology world, they thought maybe five years, I'll get into it. They had to do it in a short period of time. And you'll hear some of the stories here in terms of, of what they did.
A successful Sussex County comeback relies on each of us, on our entire community working together, supporting our local businesses and organizations to keep Sussex strong. It's all about local fine work. To keep the lights on in our business. To keep our people employed. To keep the character of our communities. To keep our dreams moving forward. Keep Sussex strong. Thank you. I, I wanted to share one last thing. Um, we were in the process when COVID started of advertising in the Mid-Atlantic region for business attraction. I had set aside around $100,000 to do that regional advertisement for business attraction. In March, when COVID hit, we pulled back. We reinvented ourselves, our economic development office, and we went to this program. And we put $85,000 of our marketing budget into this so that locals knew how important it was for them to support their local businesses. Thank you. this event on it's a great event and and I'm certainly glad to be here and I'm sure my colleagues are as well um, I'm gonna go off script a little bit when I start just because it's one of the benefits of being the last in line right so you get to hear what 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 the colleagues experiences were with COVID and and um, over the last um, year and some change I'm a deputy county administrator as well, so my, our story in ACMAC is a little bit different than what you're hearing, or maybe it's not different, but I'll share a different perspective just because of my uh, position. When we got the first rounds of CARES Act, uh, we had some tough decisions to make because in ACMAC, um, the school system is in the administration building, right? So, so schools were getting um, shut down, uh, public safety is part of the apparatus, so, um, and, and small business and economic development everybody needed help so essentially what the county did with the first round of the cares money was to kind of divide it right up in my face it's kind of divided equally uh, between public safety um, broadband believe it or not and economic development the investment in broadband was to support schools so as everybody knows, um, the schools were, our school system went on a complete home for a while and they went to a hybrid. Much of the county is not on, um, much of the county doesn't even have good inf um, internet support. So we made the, the decision to invest in hotspots so that children could learn from home and have access to broadband. And we brought, it was through the broadband, um, Robert Bridgham, is going to be speaking to you later on about um, ACMAC's broadband authority, but the broadband authority was fantastic during this and really helping to get um, kids educated and keep th keep things moving from that front. Um, on the economic development side, um, we did not we got the, our total cares allocation for both rounds were smaller than some of my colleagues gave out. Um, so, so it's, it's modest, right, but it made a difference. We did ours completely electronically. So all, all, all folks who applied did it electronically. It was a really simple, it was a one-page questionnaire that we did on SurveyMonkey. It was unbelievably simple. And um, believe it or not, our watermen in the county were the largest group of recipients for CARES money, which, which if you think about it, electronic, electronic submission and largest recipient um, with Waterman. We, I don't know how many times I was told personally, this will not work. The Waterman will not use an electronic platform. Guess what? 
they figured it out. And if they didn't have it, they, they got somebody who did. So it was really successful when it, when it came to that. Um, so I'll go ahead and with that, I'll really go to my presentation. Um, just for those of you who don't know who we are or where we are, here's a map. We're, we're, um, we're covering your southern border, right? So um, we got you covered. Uh, we're just south of, of the state line. Um, long peninsula, not very wide, got water on two sides and lots of it. Um, our school enrollment is about 5,000. Um, our population is a little more than 32,000, so we're a small co county, just a little bit larger than Danny's. Um, our workforce has gone up, believe it or not, since, since through the pandemic. We're at 17,000. Pre-pandemic, it was about 15,000, at least that's reported anyway. And then we're the birthplace of the current governor, Ralph Northam. Um, our largest employers are Purdue, um, the Wallops Complex, which is not just NASA, the, the Navy's there, the Coast Guard's there, Virginia Space and the contractors. Um, it's Tyson Foods, not Tyson Farms. I apologize for the typo here. Our school system and uh, Riverside Shore Memorial Hospital in, um, only. Our, believe it or not, and this would surprise lots of people, we're not just about rockets and aerospace. Um, actually, agriculture is who we are first. We are big ag. We are poultry. We are big farms. We are big ag. And then it's aerospace second, tourism, healthcare, and educational. So, you know, current headlines for us, what's going on or what's going on over the last couple years, um, Rocket Lab is big news in the county. It's, you know, you see a lot about SpaceX, but if you dig a little deeper, Rocket Lab is right there, um, right, right behind. Rocket Lab is a company that started in New Zealand. They've got an operation in California, and now they've got um, operations at Wallops, so we're really excited to have them there. Um, NASA, if you, if you read or if you dig, dig a little deeper about what NASA does at Wallops. They're not just all about rockets either. They're doing all kinds of things. Um, they had a part in the helicopter that's flying up um, on, on uh, Mars. So really fantastic things going on at NASA Wallops. Um, a big news for us in the central part of the county, which does not get very much play. Chincoteague and Wallops get all our headlines, but we, there are other parts of the county. Um, the Hampton Road Sewer District is, is going to be running a, a really large sewer transmission line um, actually from Northampton County into Accomack to get treatment at Onancock. So that's a, a really a big deal for us. Um, recently, actually a, local, a group of local Salisbury investors bought a building in Mapsville, Virginia. It's 100 and 50,000 square feet, it's a big building, it's in good shape, and um, I don't expect that space to be available for long. We're getting a lot of hits on that, and as a number of my colleagues said, space, ready to go space, is in demand, and it's hard to find. So um, that's one of the reasons we're seeing that. Again, as you've already heard, our real estate market is really, really hot. Um, there are homes that have been on the inventory for five and six years that are gone. Um, our inventory is at probably as low as it's been in the last 30 years. So um, it's, it's hot, I, my, for, at least for Accomac, in my own perspective on things, this looks like an, a lot of movement from the Northeast. So this, isn't, this is not locally generated um, demand. These are folks moving from places, I, I believe it's a COVID-related um, transfer of folks from from populated places to not so populated places um, our building permit numbers are up um, really up I mean I'm, I'm really proud personally that um, last March when everybody was shutting down um, we have an electronic permit platform we were open for business and issuing permits through the entire pandemic so we never we didn't close. We were getting calls from Maryland contractors because each state was a little bit different in how they did it. 
and construction in Virginia was allowed to continue and the contractors were working. And so that was a really, really, um, I think, important part to keeping the economy going. Um, our county government actually came through the pandemic um, faring really well. Um, COVID, COVID grant and, and relief money aside, um, our fiscal st status is really sound and was really good through the pandemic, which, which we did not project. We expected this was going to be about um, September of last year, the bottom of the fallout, and it didn't happen. So we were really pleased with that. And overall, as you've heard already, our economy is fairly strong right now. Um, we're doing really good. We've got a lot of new business starts. Um, everything, everything seems to be really positive um, currently. Um, now I get to get a little bit of the fun stuff, and you can see that these, these slides, the next couple of slides, are going to be a lot more exciting than mine, and they're, they're a lot neater and a lot cooler, because they were furnished by NASA, right? I don't have cool stuff, but they have cool stuff, and I get to show their cool stuff. So um, Dave Pierce, who's the director at Wallops, um, a lot, I didn't steal these. I've got permission to use these. Dave gave me permission to use the slides. And I'll highlight a little bit about what's going on at uh, Wallops and specifically what's going on with Rocket Lab um, because that's a, that's a big, a big, really big deal. Um, so this is, the, this is the, the Rocket Lab electron rocket. So this, is the, this was the reason they came to Wallops originally. Um, they built a pad out on the island about two and a half years ago. That's actually right there. The rocket is sitting on the pad. And for those of you who are familiar with Wallops, that's the Wallops uh, water tower. And if you're not familiar, I can, I'll get you a slide here in, in just a minute. So Rocket Lab's Electron was not originally proposed to be reusable. So they were building it to be a disposable rocket. It's pretty small. It's only like 66 feet tall. And it was for the kind of the small to medium payload, which is what really most folks thought Wallops niche was going to be after the, the uh, space station missions ended. Um, but as it turns out, um, Rocket Lab's got other plans. They've got plans to build a bigger rocket and not just the Electron. And they have, so this is not a trade secret, although it's not that well known, um, they've announced plans to launch from Wallops. So this is, a, this is a big rocket. So this is the size of the Antares rocket that's launched. They're now a big pay payload. And again, um, this is a reusable rocket, which apparently is the way the industry's going. Um, SpaceX is, re is reusing their rockets. Uh, it's Rocket Lab's model. The CEO, Peter Beck of, of Rocket Lab, believes that it's his vision to see rocket use just like airplanes. So they're reusable and um, you service the parts that need serviced and you, um, you send them back up again. So um, that's, that's big news for, for Wallops and for the county and really for the region that these uh, launches are going to go up. There's space tourism that goes along with this and there's just a lot of visibility and is the last bullet point um, shows on this slide. Um, there's going to be a, um, a, a place needed to build these rockets, and so Rocket Lab is currently assessing that. Uh, we're hoping that it will be Accomack County. Um, so this is this is kind of if you like I said this is what the Wallops launch pad actually looks like. I, I couldn't give you this right. This has to come from NASA, um, and so so the. The, the concrete structure kind of in the middle of the, of the page is where the Antares rocket launches happen, and that's probably where the Neutron will be launched from, too. It's a big pad. I mean, it's, 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 it's serious. The, the kind of the structure on the, to the, to lower in the screen, lower middle, is the Electron rocket, and you can actually see that, if you, if you can see it, the rocket is actually standing on the pad there. So that's a, it's a small pad, it's a small rocket, so it didn't require a lot of infrastructure. Um, and then the, the picture on the left side of the screen is the um, Rocket Lab 
facility that's actually been constructed and then is, is now um, employing folks in our um, Wallace Research Park. And um, you might notice the black on the border of the screen, the black of the building. Black is Rocket Lab's uh, signature color. So that's, that's what that's all about. It's even on their building. Um, so, and then we have a lot of other things going on um, that aren't ready for announcement yet that are WALPS related as far as um, job creation and investment. So it's, it's really positive up, in the, up there right now. So kind of that's what's going on. It's what's to look forward to. And then kind of, you know, I think that, again, I'll kind of close where I started with COVID. Um, everything looks good. The, I think everybody's feeling good about things. Um, the question is, you know, will there be a COVID hangover? And I think that's the kind of the big, that's kind of the big question mark in the room, right? Or for everybody is, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not talking about COVID itself. I'm talking about things that are a result of COVID. Um, I mean, you've probably heard about the chip shortage in the auto industry that's paralyzing that. Um, they're talking about potential gas shortages. These are things that you know could have profound effects on the economy if there's something we didn't think about or didn't see coming out of the, out of the pandemic. So it's just a concern. I'm hoping, hopeful that it will not happen, but um, you don't know. Right, you don't know what you don't know. So um, locally, again, I've said this a number of times. I think regionally, the economy looks strong. Pent up demand. I heard that word earlier. It is absolutely true. Um, and so, so at least for a while, I think things are going to be good, and we hope they stay that way for a long while. And then, um, kind of for at least locally for us, we've made a couple of runs at trying to get. Um, Route 175, which is Shinkadeek Road, which goes from 13 to Wallops and then on to Shinkadeek, that is a two-lane road right now. And um, if the growth continues at Wallops and the tourism continues to boom at um, Shinkadeek, we are going to have a problem with that road. That road just isn't big enough to to um, handle the traffic demands out in that part of the the part of the county. So. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of it for me. Um, I don't know if you have any questions. Closer needs to be closing, right? So close close it and be short and be brief and get on with things. So there you go. Thank you.